All right, please be seated if you would today. If you have Bible with you, go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter number 2, if you would. Daniel in the Old Testament, chapter number 2. Newscaster Paul Harvey told a remarkable story of God's providential care over thousands of Allied prisoners during World War II, many of whom were Christian people. One of the Americans' mighty bombers took off from the island of Guam, headed for Kokura, Japan, with a deadly cargo. Because clouds covered the target area, the sleek B-29 circled for nearly an hour until its fuel supply reached the danger point. The captain and his crew, frustrated because they were right over the primary target, yet not able to fulfill their mission, finally decided they had better go for the secondary target. Changing course, they found that the sky was clear. The command was given, bombs away! and the B-29 headed for its home base. Sometime later, an officer received some startling information from military intelligence. Just one week before the bombing mission, the Japanese had transferred one of their largest concentrations of captured Americans to the city of Kokura. Upon reading this, the officer exclaimed, Thank God for that protecting cloud. If the city hadn't been hidden from the bomber, it would have been destroyed and thousands of American boys would have died. God's ways are certainly behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes which he is behind. We have to learn this and let him work, was the commentary. You know, one of the greatest comforts and faith-building truths found within Scripture that the Scriptures proclaim is what I'd like to focus on today in regards to the supremacy of God. The ultimate supremacy of the Almighty. He rules in all things, and He knows all things. And with that knowledge within our hearts, we can live each day faithfully for Him. And I think we'll get some of that out of our passage here today. The Daniel chapter number 2, it's 49 verses. I'm going to read all 49 verses today. I want you to get the whole picture so you understand what's going on. But we're going to take kind of some bits and pieces out of it today for the message as uh, we're going to be talking about that supremacy of God. Here in chapter number 2, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says here, And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep spake, or break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto him, I have dreamed a dream. And my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. What a, what a choice. Either tell me or die. <laughs> But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye, shall, ye can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things as any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other than that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth, and the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. In other words, he was cool under, under this great pressure. To Arach, the, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arach, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? And then Arach uh, made the thing known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. And then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. 
that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now uh, what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore David or Daniel went in unto Arach, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said unto, thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the, the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arach brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a, a man of the captives of Judah that will bring, make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. For as for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed that should come to pass thereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but the, for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mayest know the thoughts of thine heart. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. The image the great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of gold, of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the, the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king thou O king art a king of kings for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom power and strength and glory and wheresoever the children of men dwell the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all thou art this gold, head of gold and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, to the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel, and commanded that they should offer an obulation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said of a truth, it is... Uh, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel required the king, requested of the king, and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Lots in there. 
But uh, there's one thought that uh, I guess kind of screams in this, uh, this whole thing. And that's the title of my message today. It's the supremacy of God. Let's have a word of prayer first. Father, we want to thank you for today for your great mercies. And Lord, we thank you for the truth that uh, can be pulled out of this. As we need to know that you are the God who overrules all. And Lord, in our day and age of much turmoil and uncertainty about the future, I pray, Lord God, that this would give us some comfort and some boldness to be able to live for you and to do right, knowing that you will guide our steps until you bring us home to glory. Thank you, Lord God, for this day and this time of study in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage is one of the most eye-opening portions of the Scriptures as God reveals to the then world ruler, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the future of the world in so many words and, and how it plays out with various dominating empires that would come on the scene from Babylon beyond that. Nebuchadnezzar had evidently been thinking about these types of things as he laid upon his bed since he ruled at that point in time the largest empire the world had ever seen. In fact, in verse 29, Daniel mentions this. He says, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? You know, he was thinking about the future. We, we tend to think about the future, don't we? I think about the future and uh, what's going to transpire and what's going to happen. And, and Nebuchadnezzar was no different. He, he, he wondered. You know, he had basically conquered the world at that time. He was riding high. Everything had been going well for him in so many words. But he sat and he wondered and he thought, you know, what's going to come, come of all this? What's going to come uh, after I'm dead and gone, if you will? So God takes the opportunity to reveal unto him and to all those that will read this passage in the future some information about the future. And at that time, he revealed it to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. However, when Nebuchadnezzar woke up, he couldn't remember it. Ever had that? You have this big, vivid dream, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, you can't remember a detail of it, but you knew it was vivid and you knew it was real. And maybe you woke up a little bit with your heart pumping a little bit and, and uh, maybe a little nervous or whatever the case might be or maybe excited. I don't know what it was about. But, but, she, but he, he, it was a very intense dream when he saw this big statue. But he wakes up and he, he just can't remember it, but he's troubled by it. <laughs> he was troubled by it so much that he, that he wanted an answer, that he, he knew he needed one. So he calls in all his regular counselors, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, in verse 2. It says here, And he commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. He said, Guys, I had this dream. I don't remember it, but can you tell me what it is? Because it bothered me so much. There's something in there I need to know. Well, they, they, they go on and and uh, they say, well, tell us what the dream was. <laughs> Guys, I don't remember it. And that made it a bit difficult for these counselors. They, 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 they couldn't sit there and dream up some sort of uh, idea upon hearing that. Well, that, that's, you know, that means this. You know, people can say a hundred things. But they couldn't do that here. They couldn't get away with lying to him. Because he couldn't even remember it. But that's the way God intended it to be. Because God had a message for Nebuchadnezzar. And, and this was a way of getting rid of the lyings. And, and disposing of them. It was to make it too hard for them to be able to deal with. Well, after the, the counselors expressed their inability to interpret the, the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, as in natural tendency for him got in a rage. He was a very emotional, <laughs> unstable man. I mean, anything that tipped him off, he, I mean, he just would, he would lose his mind in rage. And as a result, demanded that all the, the wise men in Babylon be killed, as we see in verse 11. It goes, and it's a rare thing. This is the, the argument from the, from the counselors, I'll call them. It is a rare thing that the king requireth and there is none other that can show it before thee except the gods who, whose dwelling is not with men. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of, of Babylon. I mean, he just went, went crazy. I mean, he's not thinking here. A man in rage does not think any more than a woman in rage can think clearly. 
And that's where he was. And he just, kill them all. You know, he's just mad. But God used this. Because what ends up happening is, word gets back to Daniel about the situation because his life is on the line too. He's considered one of the wise men of Babylon, along with his companions. And he knew the captain of the guard, Arach, and he's like, what's going on here? And Arach tells him, hey, this is what the king commanded, and of course, I've got to follow through with it because I'm the captain of the guard here. But I like how verse 14, Daniel says, he answered with counsel and wisdom. You know, God-fearing people can answer things with counsel and wisdom and not rage. Remember that. Because it's very easy. We, we have a world that's filled with rage, but we, they need counsel and wisdom from people that know God. And Daniel knew God <laughs> very clearly. And he says, Let us give, tell the king, give us a little time, and we'll, show, we'll, we'll, get, the, we'll get the answer. We'll get the answer to him. So, so Eric's able to buy a little time, and Daniel runs back to his uh, companions and says, hey guys, we've got, a, we've got a situation here. Our lives are on the line, but, but so are many others. And let's band together in prayer here, in verse 18, that they would desire the mercies of God of heaven concerning the secret. They began to ask God because God was the only one that can help. You know what? God sometimes puts us in situations where God, He is the only one that can actually help in the circumstance. Otherwise, it's, out, it's completely outside of your hands. You know, and some of the things that we're experiencing today are completely outside of our hands. And you know what Christian people do? They go to Facebook and start blaring out all their grievances on it instead of talking to the one that can actually do something about it. You know, we're not talking to him. I think more are than ever before. But, you know, we're going to type something on Google. You know, I'm going to just tell everyone what I think. <laughs> you know, that has not solved any problem yet. But they, they did the right thing. They went, to, they went to God. They said, God, <laughs> I believe your mercy. Our, our lives are on the line here. There's a lot writing on this, but that's what God wanted. Because God wanted to do what we read. He had some really important information for really the world to find out about. And he was going to do something special in the lives of David and, and, and or Daniel and his... Uh, we've been talking about David so much, I keep thinking of David, not Daniel. But we, uh, he, he uh, had some things for Daniel and his three companions. That he, wanted to come, that, that he wanted to do through this kind of intense crisis. But they do that. And God's entreated. God responds and gives Daniel the, the information. Verse 19, Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. It's like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and, and he goes through a little bit of a, a little bit of praising to the Lord, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some of that here in a moment. But of course, with that knowledge of the, of the, of the dream, Daniel is brought before Nebuchadnezzar hastily and expounds the dream and its meaning, which not only spares the lives of many in Babylon, but of course it promotes Daniel and his three companions into higher ranks within Babylon so that they can have greater influence within it. And as one reads this story, it's very easy to focus on the prophetic part. I mean, there's a lot, there's some really rich prophetic truths that come out of this, how, of how God predicted certain things. And we've studied that at great length before. We, we did a series on Daniel in our, when we had our Bible class hour, uh, I think last year, if I remember correctly. It's a great book. But I don't want to as much focus on that as much as I want to draw our attention to what this passage tells us about God and about His supremacy over the events of this world and the events of our individual lives. See, God desires that we know Him. I like this from the prayer of Jesus Christ right before He goes to the cross. He says, And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. <laughs> you know, that's God's desire, is that people would know him. Know, not just on the surface, not just these, you know, textbook statistics, 
but to know him in a personal, intimate, relationship-type way. For 20 years of my life, I didn't know God. I knew about him, but I didn't know him personally. I went through religion. I went through rituals from being baptized to having communion to being confirmed uh, just to show up at church oh, maybe once a Sunday uh, maybe, and you know, maybe a couple times a month if I was really faithful. But then I came to realize that it's, it's not about that. It's about having a personal relationship with him that starts the day somebody is born again or saved. And the day I got saved was April 4th of 1999 when I realized I was a lost, hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner because I committed sin against God. I deserved the just punishment for it. But then I saw that Jesus Christ came, he died on a cross, bled there so that my sins could be atoned for. And I was willing with all my heart on April 4th, 1999 at 9.35 p.m. at the Fargo Baptist Church in Fargo, North Dakota. I was, I was there with a counselor who, who showed me uh, what I needed to do and I was willing to to do it. I was willing to repent of my sin. In other words, I was willing to turn tail on my sin to God with all of my heart. I didn't want to go the, the same direction I was going in life. I wanted a new direction. I didn't want to just add Jesus to my life and just keep going the same direction. I wanted to go a brand new direction. One that was towards Him. One that was towards righteousness. One that was towards holiness. Not towards more worldliness. That I was already well in. And then by faith, Trust Him alone to atone for my sin instead of myself. Instead of all the good quote-unquote works I was trying to do. I wasn't doing that many as much as I thought I was. And that night I called upon the Lord with a heart of repentance and faith and asked Him to save me. And He did. And he changed my life from the inside out. And He gave me a relationship with Him that has taken time to grow and mature over 21 now plus years. Have you had a time in your life when you've been born again and truly know it and you have a relationship with God that's real? Because that's what God wants with you and that's what God wants with every person so that we can know Him, the God of heaven and earth, the creator of all this stuff. He wants us to know Him as much as we know the, our best friends or our closest relatives. And these stories in the Bible reveal things about him that are meant to shape our view of who he is so that we can see him in a clearer light. Because I'll guarantee you, but while you walk through this world, you pick up ideas about God that are so false and so folly, and, and, and they may even sound good, but they're so wrong. When you begin to compare it to the Scripture, I know because I've been there. God's still showing me things that I had believed about him that were not right, but I believed them to be right. And as you get to know him, you get to see him for who he truly is, and that's what he wants. You know, when you read the scriptures, I hope you and I come to him looking to know more about him. We'll not be disappointed. We'll actually be quite mesmerized by it. Quite mesmerized. And today I'd like to focus on what we see in regards to God's supremacy. And I believe these truths can be a tremendous comfort to us as we live in a very trying and uncertain time frame in world history right now. That's not just affecting our country, but the countries of the world. The whole world. But God's in control of it all, as we see, first off, His supremacy in regards to world affairs. World affairs. Now the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar by God foretold of the rise of various world empires that would come on the scene from Babylon to what we know to be the millennial kingdom of Christ. They aren't the only empires that would exist because there's plenty of empires that have come and gone and are still in even existence today. We could talk about the Mongolian Empire which had probably the vast, the most land that any empire had ever conquered. They had basically all of Asia into Eastern Europe. I mean, it was huge. But there's no mention of that in the Bible. You know, there's no mention of the British Empire, which, the Bible, which it was said that the sun never set upon the British Empire because they had so many colonies all over the world. And God used all those colonies to get the gospel in, into those countries, by the way. There's no mention of the United States of America. But yet we are, the, at this point, still the, the world superpower. But you have these empires that are mentioned 
because these empires would dominate the world during the time frames in which they existed. But after they died off, their influence would outlive them. You know, our governmental system has been influenced by the Romans and the Greeks. And those guys were influenced by the Babylonians and the, and the Medo-Persians. I mean, if you trace some of the ideals and things on how certain things are done, you can trace them all back to these dominating world empires that at one time existed. Now, that, that big image that, that Nebuchadnezzar ta- saw was a picture of, of, these, of these empires. The Babylon, of course. Then what would follow would be the Medo-Persian Empire. Vast, large empire itself. Then it would be the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Then you'd have the Roman Empire. Those have all come and gone. And then there's some prophetic ones of a revived Roman Empire that will one day come on the scene during, uh, during the, the Tribulation period. And then you have, as well, the Millennial Kingdom of Christ. But they were predicted decades to hundreds of years before they came to pass in this dream. And many of those already have been fulfilled, giving the Bible, of course, its credibility. The reason, though, that God would give all this information is because he, wanted to, he wants to drive home a point. A point we need to understand today is that he rules in the affairs of this world, in the affairs of man, world affairs. God absolutely rules. That is a very major theme in the book of Daniel itself. If you go to Daniel chapter number 4, I just want to point out a few quick verses here. But in Daniel chapter 4, this is the testimony of the salvation of Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> which is absolutely amazing. In fact, I just read it this morning. And it's powerful. But there was something that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know along with everyone else in the world. We'll see it mentioned multiple times here in this passage. It says, Daniel 4, 17. It says, This matter is the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know, in other words, all people, that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basis of men. There's a lot of preaching in that last phrase. I won't go there today. But it goes on in verse 25. Again, it's, the idea is repeated that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Look at verse number 26. At the end there it says, Thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Right at the end. Look at verse number uh, 32 at the, the last part of the verse. It says, Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Look at verse 35. And the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? What is being communicated here? <laughs> God rules, right? I mean, it's just over and over and over again. God rules in the affairs of men. God knows, or God rules in all the things that go on in this world. In fact, back in our text here, Daniel, when he's praising God after receiving the the information about the secret, or about the dream, he says in verse 21, and he changeth the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Notice, he's referring to, the again, the affairs of the nations of the world. And that's really what the whole image vision was about, how God's changing things from one thing to another to another to another. In other words, God sets up leaders, takes them down in accordance to his plan. And the central cog of his plan is this, the propagation of the gospel so that people can be saved and the establishment of, of his eternal kingdom. That's what everything's all about, what it, what it gets down to, is that people may hear the gospel so that they can either respond to it or reject it, and that with those who respond to it, God will establish his eternal kingdom. That's what it's all working towards. And what God allows in this world regards to human affairs, whether we see it right away, or understand it right away or not, 
is always working towards those goals in some regard. Now that's hard to see sometimes when you look at this world and, and, and what gets decreed and all that goes on in it. It's like, how can this help the gospel? I don't know all the time, but I know who is in control of all of it and what his plans are and his goals are. And knowing that fact is a big help to me. It is a big help to me. Remember, God controls and sees all things. I like Psalm 33, verses 13 and 14. It says, The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. He knows what's going on. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. God knows, is very, very much aware of everything going on. And it says in Psalm 66, 7, He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. <laughs> now, God's eyes are everywhere. He knows what's going on. And no nation or ruler is bigger than he is. Isaiah 40, verses 15 and 17, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted as him less than nothing in vanity. How do we know this? Because it took a micro, all it takes is a microscopic little bug to bring the world to its knees. That's exactly what's happened here. The whole world is shuttered. The great United States of America is shuttered over a virus that you can't even see with your eye. God doesn't need big, mighty armies to pull down a nation or to, to reestablish things or to shift things around. He just takes the little, the city, bitty thing and humble us like never before. But that's because he's God. Man thinks he's so mighty and big. He doesn't know what he's dealing with. People boast against him and declare things against him and blaspheme his name. But can I say this? He is so much bigger than they are and they don't even understand it. But one day they're going to see it. I couldn't imagine the fear that will pierce through people's hearts one day when they realize what they have said and done against the Almighty. Thank God he is merciful though. And has given this time period to allow people to repent of their sin and to come to Him in mercy and to find forgiveness and restoration. But you know what? There is going to come a time where the time of mercy will be done. And the things going on in our world right now are showing us our own fra frailty. We must remember all these things during this time of uncertainty. God is doing a work right now. He's doing a work through the good, bad, and even ugly decisions that are going on. From the highest levels to the lowest. Especially even amongst those who are in authority. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. Some things to really consider. See, Daniel recognized in this statement in verse 21, this, that God was in control of it all. And he certainly came to understand that more when he saw the vision of like, whoa, you know, I mean, that, that would have blown. How would you like to have gotten an understanding of this vision? You see the future in, in, in 3D. <laughs> or 4K now, right? 3D was the big thing, now it's 4K. And see all this. It's like, wow, that's incredible. May we rest more and more in those truths about God's supremacy than what the news media tells us. You know what? The news media has one goal in mind. It's to make money. And if that means to scare you and I half to death, they'll do it. But God wants to bring peace to our souls so that we can serve him faithfully in the day and age in which we live. As we see, secondly, the fact that God's supremacy is seen in, in the fact that he's wisdom's administrator. Nobody knew Nebuchadnezzar's dream, of course. Even Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember what it was. All that he knew is it troubled him. And it stirred in his heart that he had to know the truth. Even Nebuchadnezzar's counselors knew it would take a higher power, <laughs> right, to reveal the dream. I like people who don't know anything about God. They talk about the higher powers, you know. The gods, you know, something out there, you know. 
But Daniel and his three companions knew the one who could help. And that's why they go to him. Well, upon receiving the information, as we saw, Daniel, Daniel declared in verses 20 through 23, this, this kind of, it's a little bit of a, of, of a poem of praise, I'll call it. And within that, we see some mentioning about the wisdom of God in all of this. I'll read this very quickly as I'm, I'm running short on time here. It says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hath given me wisdom and might. And hath made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast made known unto us the king's matter. What we see here is the declaration of Daniel's acknowledgement of God's supremacy when it comes to knowledge and wisdom. Even stuff that nobody else knows about, but he does. He made sure Nebuchadnezzar understood that too when he stood before him. He's, he says, hey look, uh, I don't know anything, but there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And he, and he says in verse, in, in verse number 30, I'm not the special one here. I'm no different. I have no other wisdom than anybody else around. But it's God that reveals this and wants to make known to you his plans. And he's given this to you as a, uh, for, for a purpose. He, he makes it very clear. Now when it comes to knowledge or wisdom, as we might put it, God holds the position of supremacy as well. Psalm 147, verse 5 says, Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. In other words, there's no ending of it. He knows absolutely everything. The, the term often associated with that is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Nothing is outside the understanding of God. In fact, wisdom starts with Him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10 says. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You can't begin to understand anything until you start understanding God. And God reveals great wisdom. See, God knows details that we have no idea about. He knows the future, something that we can't predict. He knows how things work, for He built the universe, right? Proverbs 3.19, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath He established the heavens. <laughs> The smartest men alive at the time of Nebuchadnezzar could not even remotely come up with the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but God knew it. God knew it, for he was the originator of it. And what's wonderful is that the God of heaven is willing to impart that kind of wisdom unto us, like he did Daniel and those three companions of his, if we simply seek him. Because the Bible says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. If you and I need wisdom, we've got a God that's willing to impart it unto us. Sometimes in life situations, or sometimes in life, situations occur where answers are not necessarily cut and dry. We like them to be, and sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. There's a lot of complicated things. I have dealt with various situations where... People from the outside might look, oh, yeah, it's just a simple thing. Uh, there's a lot more to the story than you realize. And sometimes I've sat and looked at a situation, I'm like, what do I do here? Not everything's always so cut and dry. Various factors seem to even conflict on what we should do, and some are completely unknown to us. But God sees it all, knows it all. It has wisdom that can help us navigate them successfully. I know what exactly to do in what spot. Because there, there's just things that only God can see within the hearts of individuals, within circumstances, uh, factoring in the future events and all the different things that, that, that we can't even begin to calculate with our minds. God can do that just like that. And he can tell us the right step to take. And sometimes it's only one step at a time. 
but it'll get us to the, to the right spot. God always knows what to do in every situation we have in life and will give us his wisdom. Only if we ask for it, though. And wait for it until it's given. James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. There is so much we don't know about things. That'll be the, one of the great victories of our life. When we realize we don't know it all. And in fact, we probably know less than we, we actually think we know. And we'd be foolish not to ask the God of heaven who knows all things what to do. I think the reason we don't always ask him is because sometimes we don't want to hear the answer. But God has good, fruitful paths for us which our own wisdom can't find on our own. And in our text, Daniel and his company needed it, <laughs> sought God for it, and were mesmerized by what he gave them, which spared their lives and the lives of many, many other people and gives us an opening into, into, the, into the world, especially at that time that was completely mind-blowing of what was to come. And some of it still is yet to come that we even still look for. Well, thirdly and finally, we see God's supremacy gives us wonderful assurance. And that's really what I want to drive home more than anything, too. Time would fail me to dive into the abundant ways in which God's supremacy is expressed, both in this passage and throughout the scriptures. But one important truth is this. It gives us wonderful assurance. This world and all the decisions we need to make in it, the pitfalls that exist, the traps, the unseen can cause a lot of anxiety to rise up in the hearts, can it? You, you wake up every day and you, you sit there and you, you look at it and you wonder, where, what is this world going to come up with next? My wife and I were in Target yesterday and, you know, some of those, so there's certain key items that they have limited people's ability to purchase. You know, for a long time it was the toilet paper thing. And even, there's still shelves. I'm still surprised that we have, still have shelves that are missing toilet paper in some stores. That one, Target, there was, there was some empty shelves there. But there was one, one that, I, that I took notice of. It was in the, I think it was, a, it was in the medical aisle or whatever you want to call it, where you, where you could find the antacids. You could only have like one or two packages of that. I sat there and I thought, you know, why would that be so important? But what happens when people get stressed? They have stomach issues. They have, they have things that, you know, that, that create heartburn and all those types of things. And, and I thought to myself, you know, a lot of people today, they're so stressed out and worried because of things like that. In fact, I, I have a relative that's a in, in the pharmacy world. And, and she, she told me here recently that their depression meds have gone through the roof trying to sell. Why? Because people are so scared out of their minds. I mean, I know, you probably know, maybe you're one of them. <laughs> you're petrified. And I'm not saying some of the stuff that's going on isn't, isn't a little bit fearful. Certainly. I, I can't say I've never gotten fearful myself. You know, people watch the news and all the, I mean, the negativity is through the roof. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so bad. I saw my grandmother here a couple weeks ago when we were talking, and she said, I haven't even watched the news in the last two weeks because it's just, it's just so bad. Everything's so negative. It's like it's, it, she's like, it shouldn't be this way. I was like, yeah, no, it shouldn't. And people are trying to find every which way in which they can kind of deal with all this stuff. Trying to patchwork remedies. But those of us who know God, the truth that he presents about his supremacy and what he's doing and, and the grace that he provides is meant to give us some reassurance. Hey, I'm, in, I, 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 I'm doing something good. Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good. So how can any good come out of all this chaos? 
Well, you read a little bit in history and you see how God brought good after bad times and places. History is full of examples of that. The Bible is full of examples of that. God's character testifies to that. You know, we, we don't have to be ruled by anxiety and all the problems it brings upon our bodies. What we can understand is we get to know Him better, and that's, the whole, that's why I brought that up originally in the beginning of the message, was that as you get to know God, and you get to know who He is as a person and His supremacy over all this stuff and His rulership, and you know what? It just kind of has this way of bringing some peace to your heart, that the world cannot bring. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Daniel 2 is an example. That we through patience and comfort the scriptures might have hope. That's not hopeless. That's not hopeless. I can't tell you what the future is going to be, but I can tell you this. I know the God who's in control of that future and what he's trying to do. And the fact that he loves each one of us equally and as compassionately as he does, it's kind of nice to realize, okay, I can, I, can just let, I can let him be in control. I encourage each of us today to make it a point to seek him to know him because it will transform our lives and bring that needed peace and hope in this very turbulent world. John 14, 27, I referenced it just a moment ago where Jesus said, right before they went to the cross, he went to the cross, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. In other words, the world doesn't offer us much peace, but he gives us a a peace that only he can bring. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. How come? Because he has supremacy over everything, over everything that exists. May we as God's people focus on that. And if we have forgotten that, which happens, may, you go, may we go to the Scriptures with a heart that says, Lord, help me to see who you are. And help me to see your control over things because right now it looks like it's out of control. Give it time and God will reveal it to you. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. We'll just take a few moments and have a word of invitation as the pianist is going to play with every head bowed and every eye closed. If God has spoken to your heart and you need to spend some time with the Lord today, I want to give you some time to do that there. Just at your chair as the Lord would lead you.